Untold centuries ago, one monstrous act forged a terrible legacy for mankind. The world's first murder. Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, Cain rose up against Abel and slew him. Genesis 4, 8. The victim, a humble shepherd named Abel. The assailant, Abel's older brother, Cain. They are the Bible's first two siblings, the sons of Adam and Eve. The tale of this sinister deed is one of the most chilling accounts in the Bible. Though the book of Genesis records the identity of the killer, this ancient crime, in essence, remains unsolved. It's almost as though we've gotten a police report of a particularly nasty murder. And even though we have the culprit, we don't know why he did what he did. We don't know how he did what he did. Riddled with paradox, this ancient murder mystery probes deep into mankind's darkest dimension. I think the biggest mystery of Cain and Abel is why God would create creatures who have such a capacity for hatred and evil. What compelled Cain to kill his brother? Was the crime premeditated murder or merely negligent homicide? What was the enigmatic mark God branded on Cain as a consequence of his crime? And what is the haunting meaning which this, the first recorded murder in history, holds for our own time? These are but a few of the mysteries of the Bible. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Genesis 4, 1. In the beginning, mankind's first couple shares the wonder of a miracle, the first human birth. For Adam and Eve, it is a profound moment of renewed hope. Their first taste of joy since their heartbreaking expulsion from paradise by God. For them, their newborn son Cain represents the prospect of a happier future. So too does their second child, Abel. It is a hopeful new dawn for mankind. So begins the Bible's account of the first sibling relationship. But the two brothers are destined to meet a tragic end. The story of Cain and Abel is shocking and timeless. A cautionary tale rich with relevance for countless generations. But the account in Genesis, only 17 verses long, resembles a murder mystery with key pieces of the puzzle missing. In order to unlock the story's secrets, 
Biblical scholars have virtually assumed the role of criminal investigators. Two pieces missing from this ancient puzzle are complete character profiles of Cain and Abel themselves. Rather than describing their individual personalities, the Bible defines them largely in terms of their relationship to one another. But mysteriously omitted from the Genesis account are the brothers' formative years, the time in which that relationship would have taken shape. Were Cain and Abel splintered by rivalry at the outset? Or could there once have been a deep brotherly love between them that the Bible fails to mention? In search of the answer, historians have discovered one crucial clue. Throughout the brief narrative, Cain and Abel's relationship as brothers is mentioned an astonishing seven times. Is there significance to this repetition? Could it carry a hidden message? The constant repetition of the word brother is to show its ambiguity. On the one hand, they are brothers by blood. On the other hand, they're not brothers in spirit. And without the second, the first is meaningless. And so from the very beginning, there must have been friction and anger and resentment that culminated in this terrible deed. What was the cause of this bitter rivalry? Once again, the Hebrew Bible is inexplicably silent. But one theory finds its basis in a few key words of the story. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the soil. Genesis Four, two. In this harsher world outside the Garden of Eden, the brothers divide their labor to ensure the survival of their family. Is it possible that their contrasting vocations were at the heart of their rivalry? What we have here is a paradigm of ancient competition over resources because, you see, the farmers need irrigation, they need water, they need water rights. At the same time, the shepherds are looking for a place to pasture their flocks and are looking for a place where they too can water their flocks so that water becomes a real issue between these two groups. Although there was probably a professional antagonism between the brothers, it may have been merely a symptom of their rivalry, rather than its root cause. In search of the core of their conflict, scholars are drawn inexorably to the flawed character of Cain. Who is this notorious figure? What is he thinking? What is he doing during the mysterious gap in the narrative preceding the murders? Even though it's very hard to be sure about what character Cain might have had before the incident with his brother Abel and what Abel might have been like in relationship to Cain, there are some assumptions we can make. One is that Cain, as the older brother, may well have felt a certain degree of propriety, control, desire to be first in the family, because that can happen to any older child. Would he have been discriminating against his brother? Would he have been resentful of his brother, jealous of his brother? Would he have been lording it over his brother? An even more intriguing question is how Cain viewed God. Is it possible that a rivalry had developed not only between Cain and Abel, but also between Cain and God? And what was the nature of Cain's other significant relationship with his parents, Adam and Eve? Once again, the biblical text is silent. 
But scholars have discovered a clue that Adam and Eve may have foreseen the terrible tragedy to come. The evidence is contained in a time-honored Hebrew text known as the Midrash, a compilation of biblical traditions written by ancient rabbis. The rabbis tell us that Eve had a dream one night, and she saw blood coming out of Abel's mouth and falling into the mouth of Cain. When she told Adam that dream, he was extremely upset and he wondered whether or not the enmity that he was already seeing between these brothers was to turn into something worse. And so he settled the two boys in different places, gave them different households, even trained them to different professions in order to keep them apart to avert the violence that Eve had seen in her dream. Could Adam truly prevent the catastrophe foreseen in Eve's terrifying prophetic dream? Or was a fatal confrontation inevitable? Ironically, the chain of events leading Cain to commit the world's first murder begins with the first act of divine worship, an act of sacrifice. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground, and Abel on his part brought his flock and of the fat thereof. Genesis 4, 3. Each brother expresses his reverence for God with a different form of sacrifice. Each offers the product of his chosen vocation. But what has prompted them to perform this ritual is unclear. The biblical account makes no mention of God requesting it. What inspired this early act of worship? And why does it take the form of sacrifice? In the Bible, and even today, there is a sense that if you love someone, the best way to show that love is to offer something dear to you. And when somebody in the Bible wants to show God some measure of devotion or care or love, what they do is take something that's dear and offer it to God. It's not that God needs it, but people do. In response to Cain and Abel's worship, God pronounces a judgment which ignites Cain's fury. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Genesis 4, 5. The Bible does not specify the manner in which God makes his decision known to the brothers, but one theory of what may have occurred is found in the Midrash, the oral traditions of ancient rabbis. The rabbis tell us that when um, uh, Abel's sacrifice is made, God accepts it in a shooting flame that goes up to heaven and hence we know that God took Abel's sacrifice. Cain's, however, uh, just lays there inert. It's a dud of a sacrifice, and Cain immediately flies into a rage. He's filled with bitterness and envy and hatred, and perhaps the biggest problem is that he doesn't voice his hatred to the right person. It's not his brother who has rejected him, it's God. One of the great mysteries of the Cain and Abel story is the question of why God does not accept Cain's offering, but does accept Abel's offering. According to the rules of sacrifice in the Bible, a grain offering is every bit as worthy as a meat offering. Therefore, it's puzzling. It's very puzzling. What's wrong with Cain's offering? For centuries, this one question has obsessed biblical scholars. 
To answer it is imperative because it is God's unexplained preference for evil which becomes Cain's motive for murder. But what was God's motive in rejecting Cain's sacrifice? One theory focuses on a critical literary omission. The text specifies that Abel offered to God the choicest of his sheep, but makes no mention of the quality of Cain's fruit of the soil. Could this indicate that God rejected Cain because he had not given his finest offering? In the biblical text, it says that Abel offered of his best. Cain wanted to sacrifice, but without any of the pain that sacrifice must demand from somebody who's sincere. So he just offered whatever was lying around. But Abel actually showed God his devotion by offering what really mattered of his best. Either Cain didn't love God as much, or Cain loved Cain too much. God criticizes Cain when he refuses to accept his offering. And it doesn't just say God did not find favor with Cain's offering. It says God did not find favor with Cain and with his offering. So the offering is rejected not because it's a bad kind of offering, but because it's offered by a bad kind of person. Whatever God's motive for spurning Cain, his judgment sets into motion a chilling chain of events. Foreseeing the tragedy to come, he breaks his silence. Speaking directly with the infuriated Cain, he issues a dire warning. The Lord said unto Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Genesis 4, 6. It is in this passage from Genesis where the word sin makes its first appearance in the Bible. The word appears more than 4,000 times in the Hebrew Bible and New Testament. But only here is sin characterized as a living, monstrous entity. The appearance of this strange creature, sin, that is sort of crouching at Cain's door is one of the weirdest passages in the Bible. We have nothing else like this where sin is personified in quite this way. God describes sin almost like an, a dangerous animal. And that ability to be trapped by sin, to be trapped by the darker side of human nature, and to be motivated by it and led by it and to be ruled by it is what we see developing in this story even to the fatal extent that a brother can kill a brother. Unable to control his spiraling rage, Cain looked upon Abel with a murderous eye. Does Abel suspect his evil scheme? Will God intervene? Centuries ago, a world untarnished by violence basked in its last moments of innocence. For the world's first murder is about to be committed. Mysteriously, this pivotal incident in biblical history is described only briefly in the Genesis narrative. Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, Cain rose up against Abel and slew him. Genesis 4, 8. The 
brevity of the murder's description provokes questions unanswered to this day. How did Cain kill Abel? Did Cain bury or destroy the body, trying to conceal his crime? But one crucial question goes beyond the physical circumstances of the crime. Was Cain truly guilty of murder? Or could extenuating circumstances have existed, which lessen his degree of responsibility for Abel's death? Some scholars point out that before the murder, the death of a human being was an unknown experience. Did Cain realize he was capable of extinguishing his brother's life? He certainly knows what it is to kill an animal because you have to kill the animals to bring the sacrifices that his brother Abel brought. So it's implicit in the story that they really knew what it was to kill. And I would presume that Adam and Eve had taught Cain and Abel both. You can kill these animals for these purposes, but whatever you do, don't kill one of us, one of us human beings. That's wrong. Most scholars, however, believe that Cain was not aware that his attack could result in Abel's death. It's quite likely that Cain did not know the effect of the blows that he rained, whether by fist or by stone or rocks or so on, on his brother. He must have been utterly horrified, actually, since he'd never seen a dead human being before. He must have been totally stunned by what happened. It was a homicide, but not actually murder. Whether or not the fatal outcome of Cain's attack on Abel is premeditated, he cannot conceal it from God. In an unexpected twist in the narrative, a witness to the murder surfaces to expose Cain. But this is not a witness in the conventional sense. The damning testimony came from a ghostly extension of Abel himself. It's very interesting in the story how God finds out about the murder. God finds out about the murder because Abel's blood cries out to him from the ground. Here is a very interesting picture of blood as the life force, that even after you are killed, it somehow still has that quality of life in it. And this quality of life can cry out to the uh, accused, can cry out to the God uh, who judges the uh, criminal and to point out who the criminal is, in a sense. God's quest for justice forces him into an icy confrontation with Cain. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Genesis 4, 9. In this historic exchange, Cain does much more than compound his crime with a lie. In his sarcasm, he unwittingly poses a question destined to challenge the conscience of countless generations. Am I my brother's keeper is the first question that human beings ask in the Bible. And it is, in some sense, the question that every human being has to address in his or her life brother here not in the most literal sense, but am I the keeper of my fellow human beings? And God doesn't answer it because the entirety of the Bible is an answer to that question. And what it says is, if you are not your brother's keeper, then there was no reason for human beings to have been created. But if you are, then you prove yourself the crown of my creation. Cain, demonstrating himself the direct opposite of God's ideal, awaits punishment. 
Will God exact a life for a life? Or will Cain face a fate crueler than death? In the wake of the world's first murder, an unsuspecting shepherd named Abel lies dead. Precisely how, where, and why he was killed by his brother Cain may never be known. But these unanswered questions quickly give way in the biblical account to a whole new set of mysteries. Perhaps the most baffling of these mysteries is God's unusual punishment of Cain. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be on the earth. Genesis 4, 12. Rather than imposing a death sentence in the biblical tradition of an eye for an eye, God banished Cain to the wilderness. Is this an act of mercy? Or does God have a deeper purpose in allowing Cain to live? In the Bible, Cain is the first human being who lives with the knowledge that he took the life of another human being. And one senses that that knowledge tortured him, and perhaps God left Cain alive because he stood as a warning to all subsequent generations that it's not only that God punishes you when you do wrong, but that somewhere deep inside, a human being punishes him or herself, and that in some way, conscience is the most powerful and painful punisher. Some scholars suspect a different motive may lie behind God's mercy. One wonders if God doesn't feel, after the fact, something like an accomplice in Abel's murder. Because God is the one who treated the two boys differently, hence giving them a reason to fight. So we have to wonder if God doesn't feel rather sheepish about the fact that God had a part in what happened to Abel. Whatever God's motive for sparing Cain's life, his judgment inexplicably terrifies Cain. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findest me shall kill me. Genesis 4, 13. But who were the potential assassins he feared? According to the Bible, after Abel's murder, Earth's only inhabitants were Cain himself and his parents, Adam and Eve. The question of the identity of these mysterious assassins may never be resolved, but God's response to Cain's fear is unequivocal. So the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Genesis 4, 15. Cain stands alone in biblical history as the only person ever to receive such a mark. For centuries, its meaning has been misconstrued by many as a sign of shame. In reality, it was a divine form of protection. But the Bible does not specify what form the mark took. What was it? The most prevalent theory is that it was a brand on the forehead. 
We know from Mesopotamian law codes that it was common to put a marking on a convicted criminal who was about to be sent into slavery. This slave's mark was known as an abutum, and it was tattooed or gashed into the cheek or the forehead. So it may be that this is the kind of mark that Cain is receiving. This image of Cain branded on the face has become an archetype. But scholars throughout history have proposed a variety of intriguing alternatives. Some medieval interpreters theorized that the mark consisted of horns growing from Cain's head. Others considered it to be an outbreak of leprosy and still others speculated that it was not a mark at all, but a dog assigned to accompany Cain and protect him from all threats. Whatever the form of Cain's protective mark, God banishes him to the land of Nod. But where is this mysterious wilderness? The only hint provided by the Bible is that it lies somewhere to the east of Eden. To this day, no archaeological evidence has been found which pinpoints Nod's location. Some scholars believe Nod is not an actual place which can be found on a map. In Hebrew, the word Nod means wandering. Therefore, no matter where Cain roamed, he was in the land of Nod. It is at this point in the Genesis account that a new character abruptly appears, Cain's wife. Inexplicably, the Bible mentions neither her name nor how Cain encountered her in the wilderness. But the larger mystery lies in her very existence. Again, the Bible has made no mention of any other people besides Cain, Abel, and their parents. The most likely assumption is that she's actually what we would call a sister. In other words, Adam and Eve had a lot of children. We should not be fooled by the focus on Cain and Abel to think that there were not many others because, in fact, Genesis 2 tells us there were many others. So, uh, the most likely candidate to be Cain's wife is one of his sisters. Notice that Adam and Eve having other children and daughters solves the problem of where Cain's wife comes from but creates a new problem because then you have Cain marrying his sister, and that's incest. So once the problem arises in the literary history of the story, solving it like it has a domino effect of creating new problems. Whoever this unnamed woman was, she was Cain's salvation from a life of loneliness. But Cain was still a haunted man, forced to live outside God's presence for the rest of his days. What finally became of this social outcast? Like many aspects of this intriguing tale, Cain's final fate is also cloaked in mystery. Brother, Murderer, fugitive, nomad. The final chapter of Cain's tragic descent takes the story to the mysterious land of Nod. And Cain built a city and called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. Genesis 4. 17. 
Although Cain had been condemned by God to wander the rest of his days, he constructs a permanent settlement. There, with his new wife, he will bring forth a new race of city dwellers. How could a man cursed to be a nomad become the patriarch of a new community? Is it possible Cain successfully defied God's curse? Or is this a clue that God eased his punishment of Cain? Some scholars believe God allowed Cain to settle and build as an act of consolation. The most painful aspect of Cain's punishment was his severed relationship with God. To fill that spiritual void, God may have granted Cain, who destroyed life, an opportunity to create it. We know that he in fact, turns out to be a, a very able person mechanically. He's a builder. He's a creator. And so one can assume that Cain probably had a certain amount of satisfaction in that work. He probably had some of the joy that anybody would have in being a builder and a creator. But how sad that that should have to substitute for a real, true, godly relationship with his own creator. Outwardly successful, yet spiritually vacant, Cain lives out the rest of his days in the city he built. But the Bible is silent concerning how Cain finally died. Searching for clues, scholars have looked to ancient texts beyond the Bible, which offer intriguing theories. One revealing story is contained in the Book of Jubilees, an expansion of the book of Genesis from the third century before the Common Era. In its account, the manner of Cain's death eerily echoes the way that Cain had killed Abel. We are told that Cain killed Abel with a stone. The outcome of this, the implication of this, is that Cain later on dies when his house collapses. His house was made of stone. No person kills him, because God had given him a mark so that no one would kill him, but his own house kills him. The rocks kill him. The implement with which he killed Abel kills him in return. So there is a tit for tat, a life for a life. Another later theory suggests that Cain's enigmatic mark not only fails to prevent his death, but actually causes it. According to this theory, Cain's mark consists of horns growing from his head. And it is this bestial appearance which causes a tragic accident involving one of Cain's descendants. His offspring is out hunting, but he's blind, so he goes with his little boy, and the little boy says, Dad, off in that direction, I see a strange creature with a horn. Well, Cain's offspring shoots the arrow, and when the boy and the hunter go to see what has been killed, it turns out it was their father, Cain. Whatever the manner of Cain's death, the legacy of his tormented life endures. For as long as the potential for violence lurks within each human heart, perhaps the murder Cain committed will never truly be solved. And the significance of Cain's haunting question to God echoes to this day. Am I my brother's keeper? It is a question which speaks to the very purpose of our existence and which transcends our responsibility to our blood relatives. What the Bible is trying to tell us is, again, something of eternal relevance, that all human beings are indeed their brother's keepers because since all human beings go back to common ancestry, 
Therefore, no matter how far removed they may be from the original uh, Adam and Eve, they nevertheless are, are all brothers. This concept of universal brotherhood is a cornerstone of both the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. That as members of a global family, it is our sacred duty to care for one another. The tragic reality of human history, however, is that we do not. Mankind has continued to follow Cain's murderous example instead of resisting it. Ironically, it has been the conflicts between brothers which have been fought with the worst ferocity. From the American Civil War to the violence that ravages Northern Ireland, those with the closest bonds of blood and family have often strived the hardest to destroy each other. The painful question remains. Is the human family a breeding ground for violence or a place of nurturing and peace? I've always believed that in some ways, families are God's way of teaching us how to live with people that we would otherwise not know and perhaps not like because you don't choose your brothers and your sisters and your parents. And I believe that that's God's way of saying you're not allowed to go through this world only picking people who are congenial to you and whom you know and whom you like. You have to learn how to live with a variety of creations. And therefore, you have brothers, you have sisters, you have parents, you have children. The tragic fate of the Bible's first family serves as a chilling warning to all families today. For what might have been a story of brotherly love between Cain and Abel is instead a tale of murder. How this affected their parents, Adam and Eve, the Bible does not say. In the final mystery of this tragic story, the Bible omits any mention of the sorrow and grief they must have felt. Poor Adam and Eve. They saw in their children the outworking of their own sin. The sin they had introduced coming full circle in their own children. So it must have hurt. It must have hurt a great deal. More deeply bonded than ever by their grief, did Adam and Eve finally transcend their tragic loss? For despite the fate of their first two sons, they were willing to try again. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son, and called his name Seth. Genesis 4:25. The birth of Seth bears witness to the resilience of the human spirit. When Adam and Eve go ahead and conceive another child, it rather reminds me of population studies that show how the birth rate booms after a war. It's a way of saying, despite the fact that there has been this terrible destruction, we still essentially believe in the goodness of life and the worthiness of God's world. In that sense, it's one of the first statements of faith in the Bible and one of the deepest.
Untold centuries ago, one monstrous act forged a terrible legacy for mankind. The world's first murder. Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, Cain rose up against Abel and slew him. Genesis 4, 8. The victim, a humble shepherd named Abel. The assailant, Abel's older brother, Cain. They are the Bible's first two siblings, the sons of Adam and Eve. The tale of this sinister deed is one of the most chilling accounts in the Bible. Though the book of Genesis records the identity of the killer, this ancient crime, in essence, remains unsolved. It's almost as though we've gotten a police report of a particularly nasty murder. And even though we have the culprit, we don't know why he did what he did. We don't know how he did what he did. Riddled with paradox, this ancient murder mystery probes deep into mankind's darkest dimension. I think the biggest mystery of Cain and Abel is why God would create creatures who have such a capacity for hatred and evil. What compelled Cain to kill his brother? Was the crime premeditated murder or merely... Genesis 4, 1. In the beginning, mankind's first couple shares the wonder of a miracle, the first human birth. For Adam and Eve, it is a profound moment of renewed hope. Their first taste of joy since their heartbreaking expulsion from paradise by God. For them, their newborn son Cain represents the prospect of a happier future. So too does their second child, Abel. It is a hopeful new dawn for mankind. So begins the Bible's account of the first sibling relationship. But the two brothers are destined to meet a tragic end. The story of Cain and Abel is shocking and timeless. A cautionary tale rich with relevance for countless generations. But the account in Genesis, only 17 verses long, resembles a murder mystery with key pieces of the puzzle missing. In order to unlock the story's secrets, biblical scholars have virtually assumed the role of criminal investigators. Negligent homicide. What was the enigmatic mark God branded on Cain as a consequence of his crime? And what is the haunting meaning which this, the first recorded murder in history, holds for our own time? These are but a few of the mysteries of the Bible. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, 
and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. And resentment that culminated in this terrible deed. What was the cause of this bitter rivalry? Once again, the Hebrew Bible is inexplicably silent. But one theory finds its basis in a few key words of the story. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the soil. Genesis 4, 2. In this harsher world outside the Garden of Eden, the brothers divide their labor to ensure the survival of their family. Is it possible that their contrasting vocations were at the heart of their rivalry? What we have here is a paradigm of ancient competition over resources. Because, you see, the farmers need irrigation, they need water, they need water rights. At the same time, the shepherds are looking for a place to pasture their flocks and are looking for a place where they too can water their flocks so that water becomes a real issue between these two groups. Although there was probably a professional antagonism between the brothers, it may have been merely a symptom of their rivalry, rather than its root cause. In search of the core of their conflict, scholars are drawn inexorably to the flawed character of Cain. Who is this? Two pieces missing from this ancient puzzle are complete character profiles of Cain and Abel themselves. Rather than describing their individual personalities, the Bible defines them largely in terms of their relationship to one another. But mysteriously omitted from the Genesis account are the brothers' formative years the time in which that relationship would have taken shape. Were Cain and Abel splintered by rivalry at the outset, or could there once have been a deep brotherly love between them that the Bible fails to mention? In search of the answer, historians have discovered one crucial clue. Throughout the brief narrative, Cain and Abel's relationship as brothers is mentioned an astonishing seven times. Is there significance to this repetition? Could it carry a hidden message? The constant repetition of the word brother is to show its ambiguity. On the one hand, they are brothers by blood. On the other hand, they're not brothers in spirit. And without the second, the first is meaningless. And so from the very beginning, there must have been friction and anger